hello and welcome to part 1B of what will be a three-part series as part of the costume collaboration Corsetry in Motion. I'm Shannon and in part 1A I looked at what defines a sports corset, why there are various names for this garment, some early predecessors, and we started to look at the dress reform movement and how that contributed to the development of the health corset. This half of part one will cover the bicycle craze, the rise of Dr. Warner's health corset company, and will attempt to answer the question, who was wearing these corsets? I already did my list of disclaimers in the last video, but to summarize, I've done a lot of research, I tried my best to be accurate, but I am not infallible, so don't be a dick in the comment section. So, starting with the bicycle craze. <laughs> If dress reformists slowly and steadily advanced the development of lighter corsets that didn't restrict movement, the bicycling craze accelerated that progress into warp speed. There is evidence that women had been bicycling as early as the 1820s, but it didn't start to become a mainstream option until the 1880s with the development of various safety models. Prior to these models, riding a bicycle, called an ordinary in the time, but what we would recognize as a penny farthing today, was more difficult and dangerous, and women who wanted to ride during the 70s and 80s were generally limited to the tricycle. These three-wheeled models allowed for long skirts and often a chaperone, and allowed a well-to-do woman to enjoy a ride with her husband on a pleasant spring day. But they were also cumbersome, costly, and not especially well suited to urban riding, which effectively cut off the tricycle's accessibility to middle and working class women, and was reserved for wealthy women with access to a private garden. While the tricycle never gained hold in the general population, its popularity among European royalty and wealthy American women helped to make the concept of riding more accessible for women. When the new safety model was introduced, the stage had already been prepped for a new era of women's cycling. While the gentler sex was restricted to the tricycle, men had been picking up bicycling in increased numbers, and after seeing the possibilities of the tricycle and the ordinary, many women began to advocate for a safer and more affordable model for themselves. Bicycle manufacturers, always a slave to profit, recognized the purchasing power of young active women of the emerging middle class and thus developed the safety model. This new design was a model that we would recognize today as a normal bicycle and was sold with a drop frame to allow for ease of mounting with a full skirt. With these modifications, cycling became a main leisure activity by the mid-1890s and fashionable women needed fashionable outfits to match their new pursuits. There is a whole other video here on the intricate relationship between women's liberties, rational dress, and bicycling. But to stay on track, let's just say that many health corset companies jumped at the opportunity to take one of their pre-existing products and, with a few slight modifications, advertise it as part of every fashionable lady's wardrobe. Manuals on cycling for women parroted the same clothing advice and principles that dress reformers had been arguing for. Light clothing, equally distributed over the entire torso, no constricting or tight bands, and absolute freedom of movement. Corsets specifically used for cycling during the period reflect these recommendations, advertised as being cut low in the bosoms and short on the hips. Or this ad which promotes cutaway hips and elastic gores, simultaneously reassuring the dress reformist that their product ensures perfect freedom while guaranteeing traditionalists shape and gracefulness. Marie Ward's Handbook for Lady Cyclists recommends that, quote, a corset, if one is worn, should not extend below the waistline and should have elastic side lacing. And so something like this Ferris cycling waist would fit the bill. An alternative approach taken by the Ball Corset Company was to have the underarm panels of their corset include coiled wire springs that ran parallel to the waistline. These springs were then covered by sheared elastic sections. A British solution, found in this newspaper from 1895, describes a transparent corset that is porous and pliable without bones or busks, and which strongly resembles an extant ventilated corset in the V&A's collection from the same era. Yeah. 
I had a hard time finding a similar style of corset in the USA in the 1890s, but for sure they existed. What I did find was a plethora of corsets and corset ads, which were advertised for active, sport-loving women, and that were virtually identical to the corded health and hygienic corsets already being produced. Now that we've touched on the general circumstances that surrounded the rise in popularity of these garments, let's take a look at how all of these elements played out in one specific instance. To do this, we will be looking at Lucien and Dever Warner, creators of the Dr. Warner Health Corset and builders of an empire. We are quite lucky to have not only the personal memoirs of Lucien Warner, but we also have the book Fig Leaves and Fortunes, written by the great-grandson of Lucien and Dever, who combined information from Lucien's memoirs with family scrapbooks of newspaper articles. Additionally, if you are lucky enough to be relocated in Bridgeport, Connecticut, the library there also appears to have a huge collection of records of Warner Corset Company dating from 1866. To start with, some very quick background on the doctors Warner. Lucien and Devere grew up on a farm in central New York. Their father died when they were quite young, leaving them and their mother to work the farm alone. It was understandably a hard work that neither of them enjoyed much and they resolved to escape the farm life as quickly as they could. If we take the Cliff Notes approach to their life, we find them studying and then practicing medicine, specifically traveling the country giving a series of lectures on psychology and hygiene. These lectures, which started in 1867 and continued for several years, were presented mostly in small towns in New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, with the brothers holding office hours during the day and performing their lectures in the evenings. These lectures, designed to first draw a large crowd and then hold their attention, seem to be quite the spectacle, with a wide range of props, including a skeleton, a life-size mannequin, a selection of actual body parts, and various maps and charts of the human body. Anything to enlighten their audience and fortify the brothers' wallets. As a medical doctor, Lucien agreed with dress reformists on the notion that the corset was harmful, writing, quote, an entire revolution in women's dress is greatly needed. A prominent fault is compression of the waist. It is our firm belief that the only really healthful apparel is a loose dress. Always enterprising, the doctor's Warner began to look for something that could take the place of the corset, but still give the appearance of a small waist without constricting it in an unhealthy way. For several years during these tours, they carried with them a waist pattern that was intended to be worn in place of a corset, and the pattern, the author claims, was copied by several thousand women in the towns they visited. The main problem with this garment, however, is that while it was comfortable, it didn't really shape a small waist. It was in the summer of 1874, one year after they had stopped doing their lecture tours, that Devere invented an improved version of their waist, with straps over their shoulders and a section of fabric along the bottom of the waist that was held away from the body by a reed and gave the illusion of a small waist without actually compressing it. According to the book, quote, there whatever it was more than a waist, not quite a corset, was an immediate roaring success. The first goods were made in a single room tailor shop under 25 feet square, and within a few weeks, the brothers had a flourishing enterprise on their hands and both gave up their lecturing and medical practice to devote full time to it. Relatively early in this process, they were threatened with a lawsuit from Madame Foy, from whom they had admittedly copied part of the original design. This lawsuit led to a large change in construction of their garment, which eliminated the patent infringement and improved their product. Their original name, Dr. Warner's Sanitary Corset, was also owned by somebody else, so they changed to Dr. Warner's Health Corset. Neither of the brothers having any experience in pattern making understandably led to some initial difficulty with the patterns not fitting as well as they should. Anyone who's ever tried to draft their own corset can sympathize. So Lucien personally took up the study of pattern making and became his own expert on patterning and pattern grading. Devere thought up new designs while Lucien made sure they fit. Within a couple of years of the move, in the early 1880s, both brothers, previously poor struggling farm boys, were millionaires. Their money came not only from their incredibly successful corset waists, a line which admittedly was eventually expanded to include normal corsets as well, but also from the development of the Coraline corset. 
most corsets at the time were boned with horn or whalebone, which tended to stiffen with age and break. The doctors learned how to use the Tampico fiber from the Mexican Ixtal plant, which, with the correct treatment, could be made into a flexible yet unbreakable boning material. Business was booming, and only 12 years after its founding, Warner Brothers employed some 1,500 workers. Most of them were female immigrants who lived in slums and tenement buildings in Lower Bridgeport. Concerned about the living conditions of their employees, and with more money than they know what to do with, the Doctors Warner built the Seaside Institute opposite the factory, as a home away from home. It contained a library, a music room, and halls where classes were given in penmanship, drawing, English, and fancy sewing. Meals could be purchased at cost at the restaurant, and it even had lavatories containing six bathtubs supplied with hot and cold water. A luxury for the era when one block in the Lower East Side of New York is listed as containing 2,781 inhabitants, but not a single bathtub. Regardless of their success, the Doctors Warner still relentlessly pursued new ideas for making money and building their enterprise. They had their own representatives in Paris, keeping them up to date with news of the latest turns of the haute couture. They collaborated with Bradfern & Sons, a well-known British tailoring firm that was dressmaker by appointment to Queen Victoria and credited with making tailored clothing chic for women. This collaboration led to an entire line of corsets sold under the Redfern name. For the sake of this video and your attention spans, we will leave the Doctors Warner here, right around the turn of the century. The company continued on, being passed down through the family until it was bought out by the Phillips Van Heusen Corporation in 2013 for $2.8 billion. The old factory in Bridgeport was abandoned for several decades until at least part of it was purchased and turned into swanky apartments. Courtesy of Google Maps, you can actually go take a little virtual tour around the outside of the abandoned buildings. I'll include those addresses in the description. The Warner Brothers Enterprise, built upon the invention and promotion of the health corset, although admittedly expanded to include several models of regular corset, radically changed their lives. Their once simple lifestyle now included socializing with elites like John D. Rockefeller and Theodore Roosevelt, and their houses looked like baronial castles. The Doctors Warner, trained in medicine, but both with entrepreneurial souls, saw an opportunity, seized it, and with a bit of ingenuity and perfect timing, became the model of the American dream, pulling themselves up from a poor farm family whose yearly spending didn't exceed $3, to an international corporation that sold millions of corsets and had business connections across the world. And so now we turn to the least quantifiable portion of this topic, and that is, who was wearing these corsets? Sure, all of the advertising claims that these corsets were the newest thing, the biggest craze, but I mean, that's advertising. That's their job. So how popular were these corsets really? In a nutshell, it's incredibly hard to say. On the one hand, there are relatively few surviving athletic and health corsets, at least compared to normal fashion corsets. And a lot of those ads are found in publications like The Delineator and Ladies Health Journal, magazines brimming with depictions of the latest, most fashionable dresses, and from what I was able to tell, aimed at the upper middle class women. So there certainly is an argument to be made that these corsets were more of a fashion fad, limited to those with enough disposable income and free time to take up trendy pastimes and buy multiple corsets indeed multiple outfits, for those sports. However, I am of the opinion that they were more popular than either of these arguments would suggest. Explain. Well, first off, I'd like to consider the immense quantity of these ads that I see in basically all of the primary sources I looked at, including numerous daily newspapers, magazines, pamphlets, and theater programs. I couldn't open a publication without stumbling onto a multitude of ads for health corsets, bicycle waists, and other varieties of the same basic garment. Now, the presence of advertising clearly does not prove popularity, as we all know. But here's the thing. It's basic economics. If a product is repeatedly not selling, advertising will be changed. The product will be pulled. There is a reason I have never eaten a Colgate frozen dinner. 
I consistently found ads across virtually all publications spanning several decades, and while there were changes in product design, it was a slow and steady evolution of the base product rather than a total overhaul. Also, many of the advertisements proclaimed that there were many inferior imitations out there, but only theirs was the one true... Why create a knockoff of a product unless the original product enjoyed a large level of success? Personally, I interpret this phenomenon as a sign that these health corsets were more than a whimsy that a minority of the population purchased, and that they were at least popular enough to spawn imitations and knockoffs. Secondly, I think we can look at the immense success of businesses such as the Warner Brothers and the Ferris Company. In an article entitled The History and Mystery of Corsets, apparently even in 1888 corsets were somewhat of a mystery, the author, who has no apparent bias nor reason to promote the Warner Brothers agenda, wrote of their corset, quote, the merit and popularity of these corsets is attested by the fact that over 2 million were sold last year in this country alone, and the sales are increasing rapidly year by year. And that is just the one company. You might argue that a portion of the Warner Company's success came from the sale of their other corsets, such as the Coraline corset. So let's turn to the Ferris Brothers Manufacturing Company, makers of the infamous Good Sense Waist, and a company whose products were limited to health corsets and corded waists. The company was founded in 1878, and I found ads for their products through at least 1920. The two brothers died in 1920 and 1923, and while it was significantly harder to find any concrete numbers on their business, Edith Ferris, the widow to Murray Ferris, estimated that her husband's estate was worth 725000 which multiple sources estimate at just under a million dollars in today's currency. The obituary of Murray Ferris stated that the growth of their business had been continuous and that Ferris wastes are now sold throughout the USA and Canada. I find it hard to believe that these products could enjoy such success if health and sports corsets were solely a fleeting trend of the rich and well-to-do. So if athletic and health corsets were as popular as I'm suggesting, then why don't more of them exist? Just because there aren't loads of surviving examples doesn't actually have much correlation to their popularity. There could be relatively few examples of these corsets surviving because they were popular among a limited portion of the population. But I believe it's more a direct result of survival bias and the very nature of these garments. Let's look at what types of garments get preserved. If you want a really great overview of survival bias, check out the video that Abby and Kenna did over on Noelle's channel for CocoVid last year. A lot of what they focused on was related to why smaller garments tend to survive and remain in private collections, but some of the same principles apply to our situation. Textiles are incredibly fragile, one of the least preserved objects from past decades, and only a tiny fraction of what was ever made and worn survives to future generations. The garments that survive the most are the fancy outfits worn to balls or weddings because they were only worn a tiny handful of times, so they stay in good condition. And their quality, workmanship, beauty, and often tiny size are a strong motivator to preserve them rather than sell them or alter them to fit someone else. Just look at these two corsets, dating from within a year of each other, as close as we can reasonably date them which one is more likely to be viewed as an object of beauty and value, and therefore worthy of taking up space in your closet or attic for nostalgia's sake? Almost certainly the fashion corset, made of expensive and extravagant fabric, in beautiful and trendy designs. Not the plain utilitarian corset, made from the stronger but more modest and economical white cotton, jean, or linen. They were meant to be a more practical corset. They were not ornamental or decorative or something that would only be worn on the best of occasions. Quite the opposite, in fact. They were intended to be worn in the most grueling of daily activities, while one was exercising, moving vigorously about, applying lots of friction on the fabric, and potentially sweating heavily, all of which are very detrimental to the preservation of the cloth. Additionally, many of these advertisements hailed their washability, meaning that this was essentially the first time in the history of corsets that these garments were able and intended to be laundered, which immensely cuts down on their lifespan. 
So if you consider all of these facts, it seems little surprise that relatively few of these garments still exist. In conclusion, I personally believe that, with the trends in dress reform and the rising popularity of women's sports, bicycle fever leading the charge, the stage was perfectly set for health and sports courses to enter the market not as a fleeting fashion fad of the wealthy upper-class woman, but as a garment whose practical and utilitarian nature would be appealing to women of all classes. And the booming success of companies such as Warner Brothers and the Ferris Company who specialized in producing these very garments would seem to support that conclusion. So that about does it. If you're still here, thank you so much for sticking with me on this deep dive into health corsets. I hope I covered everything you were hoping to learn about, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. I have a lot of information that is tangentially related to this topic, but didn't make the cut in order to streamline this incredibly long script. Things like musical bustles, shrieking corsets, scandalous advertisements, bishops versus bloomers, and tales of two wives. There should be a video with all those miscellaneous tidbits coming out shortly, as well as part two of my Corsetry in Motion contribution, where I attempt to recreate an athletic corset based on extant examples. And of course, part three, where I will wear this corset as I, a professional athlete and performer, go through my show routines. If you enjoy this video and would like to follow me through the rest of these athletic corset related endeavors, please consider subscribing. Like last time, there will be a Google Doc in the description with the links to my various resources for those of you who are inclined to check them out for yourselves. And as last week, thoughtful corrections, kind words, and lively yet polite discussions are welcome down in the comments section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.